What's up, SCS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in true crime, and today we deliver in a big, big way. Tonight, a unique STS experience as we examine the story of Jody Plouchet. Uh, from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Jody made national headlines in March 1984 when he was abducted by his karate teacher and taken 2,000 miles away from his home to Los Angeles. FBI officials rescued Jody, and his abductor was arrested. Upon his karate teacher's return, Jody's father, Gary, shot and killed the perpetrator. The shooting was captured by WBRZ News crew, a local ABC affiliate in Baton Rouge. Since then, countless tens of millions have witnessed the murder on TV or now online. Best guest tonight, Jody Plouchet himself. He has worked in the field of violence prevention since 1995 while attending Louisiana State University. He served on the executive board for Men Against Violence, a campus organization aimed at preventing campus violence, including sexual assault and other physical violence. For seven years, Jody worked at Victim Services Center of Montgomery County, a comprehensive crime victim center in Norristown, Pennsylvania. Jody detailed his experiences in his 2019 book, Why Gary Why? The Jody Plouchet Story, and speaks out often about how parents can detect potential abusers. You know the other two faces pretty well. Dr. Ann Burgess is an internationally recognized pioneer in the assessment and treatment of victims of trauma and abuse and author of A Killer by Design, Murders, Mindhunters, and My Quest to Decipher the Criminal Mind. Among her many awards and accolades in 2016, she was named a living legend by the American Academy of Nursing. She's also worked with the FBI Academy Special Agents to study serial, serial offenders and the links between child abuse, juvenile delinquency, and subsequent perpetration. You know the super successful Netflix show Mindhunter about the FBI's first days of criminal profiling? Well, she worked with the real-life agents the show is based on. And then, of course, we've got Dr. Gary Bricado. He is presently a visiting scholar at Boston College, where he collaborates with Dr. Ann Burgess and Victor Petreca on forensic research. They've examined crime scenes such as murder, including serial killing, sex offenses, mutilation and dismemberment, and the insanity defense. He's currently serving as a consultant on a grant-funded project by Burgess and Petraka analyzing murders involving asphyxiation by strangulation and other means. He is a member of Dr. Burgess's Super Sleuths group, in which experts from diverse forensic disciplines convene to provide consultation on various cold cases. Gary studies, among other things, how violent thoughts and actions emerge in psychotic versus non-psychotic persons. He is the co-author of The New Evil, Understanding the Emergence of Modern Violent Crime. A uh, quick reminder to everyone, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you can follow us at all those places. Twitter, we are at Podcast STS. You can become a YouTube member to support us or follow us on Patreon. And I promise you that merchandise store is coming soon to survivingthesurvivor.com. I am going to tonight hand the reins over to Dr. Burgess and Dr. Bricado. I will just be muting and unmuting and chiming in with some STF Nation comments. So uh, all of you enjoy. Some of this could get a little maybe disturbing, possibly graphic. So I want to warn everyone ahead of that. But without further ado, Dr. Burgess, Dr. Bricado, it's all you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's really, really good to be here again, and also to see Jody and his cat, who is <laughs> amusing us as he prances around the room. Uh, so this is, is really delightful, and it's so good to see you. We we met Jody. Uh, I I don't know. It, it was twenty. It was twenty oh two. So it's two thousand and two. Actually, it was a, it was a Wednesday. Uh, October 2nd, 2002, is the, it was the day the D.C. sniper started shooting. Who's from Baton Rouge? Oh, okay. I know. Okay. Very good. Very good. 
Well, it's good to see you again, even though it's been a long time. Let's not wait that long <laughs> next <laughs> time. But uh, I know Gary and I are really interested in, in talking with you and, and learning what we can learn about in helping victims and survivors. I think that's an important thing. And um, I know I, I wanted to start off with one uh, uh, question. You know, you really experienced two very traumatic uh, traumas within a very short time. And I wonder how you think about them. Are they, what are the similarities or the differences? How, how do you manage to have two, it, very close in time also, with the disclosure of your own victimization? And then, of course, the, uh, your father's uh, uh, killing of the karate teacher. How do, how do you manage it? Because you have successfully, and I know in your book that you do, but that's my first question. All right, so I think a lot of it had to do with my my mother. I, I give her credit because, um, and I also give Mike Burnett. Mike Burnett was the sheriff deputy that did led the investigation of my kidnapping, and he gave her advice. He said, "Look, whenever whenever he came with the FBI report that said that I had been sexually abused, or basically they found spermatozoa on the rectal slide." Um, He's the one that told my parents and he told my mother, he said, you got to talk to Jody, but you got to remain calm. And by remaining calm, uh, that allowed me to kind of talk more. And so she was basically my counselor. People go, did you ever get professional counseling? I did for like six months, but she served that role for me, the main role. And I was surprised at how calm she was. And I think by her calmness and her support, uh, Mike Burnett told her, he said, June, he probably knows more about sex than you do. And so I think that that was the catalyst for my, uh, I want to say, recovery. Very good. Very good. Gary, you want to um, weigh in? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's an honor to meet you. I, I, um, I've been familiar with your case, the, the, the story of what happened to you for a long time. I've taught about it. And I was in the process of writing about the, the uh, victims and the wide ranging multi generational effects of a violent crime for an opening chapter of a book I'm doing. And when I found out that I would have the opportunity to speak to you, I was thrilled uh, that that it, that you might be willing to do that. And then we sort of came up with the idea of doing it together like this. So I really want to thank you. It, it means a very great deal. Um, one of the things that I was always interested in when talking about this case is um, when I learned that Jeff Doucette, the, the offender in this case, was somebody who at least allegedly had his own history of having been sexually molested. And, um, and then he went on in his, you know, adolescence and young adulthood to offend with so many children that he wasn't even capable of keeping track of the number. Uh, it was so endless that he couldn't. And then what horrified me was that I learned that he had a record that was expunged, that he wound up having his 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 record wiped and then was able to move to Louisiana and begin this new life as a as a karate instructor so that there was no background that would have led to him as somebody who had had a horrendous appetite for multiple victims who had probably by then become a master groomer and a, and a master of being able to. Now, I guess the first thing I wanted to ask you, because, uh, you know, and it's a hard thing to talk to you about is, did he ever talk about his own personal history to you during the years he was getting to know you? Because he's sort of an enigma. You can't find anything about him. Uh, except what he reported himself at the time of arrest in that brief period before his his own murder. Did he ever talk about it? He never talked about it to me. Um, but I believe his confession on the plane ride home because his sister, had his, his older brother had gotten a really bad car wreck. So his sister came from Port Arthur, Texas and stayed with us uh, at the house. And she told my mother about the abuse that she had suffered where basically her mother would prostitute her out to men. And she got pregnant at 13 and had a baby at 14. And so that's, that's why I believe it. I, I believe that that's absolutely 100% true. But he never talked about it to me. 
where sorry gary i had you mute. that gary i'm sorry i had you muted i'm gonna have you mute and unmute yourself okay oh okay uh, well usually in cases where there are that many victims um you're usually looking at the kind of offender who is simply snatching somebody off the street and then taking them somewhere and committing these offenses and then releasing the victim or doing far worse and um, but in this particular situation, it seems that there was a meticulous, long process of grooming that went on that seemed probably out of character for the way that he had been operating before. And I and I wonder, is there any truth to that idea that that there might have been some change in his M.O. and that that for some well, reason, because grooming takes a long time and there wouldn't have been a lot of time for him to, to have so many victims if he was doing that each time. Well, well, and, and he was also one month into his 25th year. So there could have been too many victims because, I mean, he was still a young guy. But Jeff, he would surround himself with kids because we had the karate fighting team. So there was probably like 10 of us or eight of us on the fighting team. So he had different age levels. So there, there was one victim that he confessed to that I'd never met. I've only, my dad was friends with his dad. And then there was another victim before me, but he aged out. Like he went through puberty and, and so then I was next in line. But he had my little brother. He had another couple of little kids. And there were a couple other ones in the karate studio uh, or the karate, you know, t fighting team that I think he, he would, like, stay at their parents' house and he would molest them. So, no, he, he had it, you know, he had his levels, I mean, to where he would just oh, move yeah. on to the next one. So the idea was that he was able to achieve that many victims in a short period of time because there were large pools that he was drawing on. And so, therefore, everybody was keeping secrets. Nobody in the pool said to the other students, something is a little uncomfortable. Something's he managed to get everybody to stay quiet. One of the tricks that he, yes, one of the tricks that he used was he would tell my parents, oh, you don't want to go hang out with these parents over here. Uh, I don't want to say the kids' names, but he would say, don't hang out with, let's say, Billy's parents because they're swingers. And so my parents were like, well, we're not going to go hang around them. And then he'd go back and tell Billy's parents, not their real name. He would go tell Billy's parents, oh, Gary's an alcoholic and, you know, you don't want to hang around them. So he kept the parents distant from each other as well by talking about them to each other. So that was another way he was protecting himself and, and I guess, keeping people from putting two and two together. And uh, let me just jump in here real quick. Verbal Judo writes, thank you, SGS Nation, for this or SGS for this education. And there's definitely uh uh, important, valuable material to be learned here. Um, I just worry for those of uh, us, those of you in the audience who don't know the story that well. Uh, I know uh, Anna, and Gary are really jumping into it, and Jody obviously lived it. So, uh, jo Jody's um, the, the the person who was abusing and assaulting Jody was a guy named Jeff Doucette. He was 25 years old at the time, and I believe a Marine. Um, and Jody said he initially saw his 20 something instructor because he became his karate instructor as a best friend. Uh, and um, Jody has gone on the record as saying that when Doucette started to abuse Jody, he really wanted to stay quiet to avoid upsetting his parents or getting uh, Jeff Doucette in trouble. Because that is, I assume, off the mindset of a child. You don't want to get uh, a grown up. Uh, in trouble. And then at one point, uh, Jeff Doucette, who was, as Gary said, grooming Jody, uh, suggested that they go to California together. And I think they, uh, Jody told him and, and Jeff Doucette told uh, Jody's mother they were just going to be gone for 15 minutes and ended up hopping on a bus and heading out uh, to Los Angeles. So I hope that uh, fills in some of the gaps. And then I'll hand it back off to Ann. Um, who I'm sure has something she would like to discuss. Yes. Um, we always talk about how we can uh, help people, especially boys, come forward and talk about what is happening to them. Since you've gone through this, uh, Jody, what can we learn from your experience that we can help current generations that the males seem to have, especially boys, well, young boys seem to have real difficulty disclosing something. And I know you, is it the secret? Is it the specialness? Um, he, 
he certainly controlled you. This Jeff really controlled not you, only you, but your family, your parents, that he could be that powerful. Uh, and he's only 25 years old. So he certainly learned something himself through the years. But um, how does that work? And have you had luck in getting kids to come forward? Um, well, the, the first time I ever went on the Geraldo Rivera talk show, I was 18 years old, almost 19 years old. It was 1991. Um, we filmed it in April and it aired in June. And after it aired, I got a phone call from Mike Barnett, who was with the Baton Rouge Sheriff's Office. And he called me and said, look, this is going to be on the news. I want you to hear it from me first. We arrested this pastor who had been molesting these two boys. And the kids saw you in Geraldo. And he, he said that after seeing you in Geraldo, it gave him the courage to uh, come forward. So I think by speaking out, and that's why I decided I was going to speak out. Because I think speaking out, you know, if, if someone who's watching it right now, watching this right now, might be like, you know what? This is happening to me. Let me tell. Um, that's, that's one of the things. But a lot of the, the, I think, the stigma with males, most of the time the perpetrators are males. I mean, not, I know we, you know we get the high school teachers here and there, but it's usually a male perpetrated on a male, and there's a, still the whole st stigma of homosexuality. I was reading comments on an interview I did the other day, and they're like, you know, yeah, he must be gay. And a lot of times that's what keeps the child from coming forward. Um, so uh, as we get better in society at being more accepted, hopefully more people will be able to share their story and come out. Great, great, yeah. And you, you mentioned the myths that are out there, the misbeliefs. What did you have to face as far as the uh, myths and the misbeliefs when you, when you were able to disclose? What did you find the hardest? Well, not, to me, I didn't disclose. I, and I, I lied to protect, not Jeff, but to protect me. Because I knew I had gone to the hospital and I knew they had run a rape kit on me. So I knew that was going to come back positive. So I, I basically had to confess to it. I didn't, you know, I didn't disclose it. I confessed that this is what really happened. Okay. Um, Gary, I wanted to jump in here and Ann uh, to ask Gary a question. Um, first of all, shout out to Pamela Hewitt here, new subscriber. Thank you for doing that. And then Jay Thomas Reset, who's a friend of the show, um, he writes, and, and he can be a bit cynical, Jay Thomas Reset, but he, he comes on often. He writes, evil is a foot in our world, soon to be worse. Humanity tends to chaos. Gary, I want to ask you, evil exists, I assume. Um, where do you cross that line from I don't know, being demented to truly evil. What is truly evil, Gary? Well, I mean, first of all, could win the it, Nobel Prize for being able to answer this age-old question. Do it in, other, you know, do it in but, under but, 11 but, words, Let's please. see if we can do it in two minutes, right? <laughs> well, um, I think that the word evil, which, you know, as I always say, has its roots in the Germanic word ubu, which means extra or beyond, really lies in um, things that are not necessary for any pragmatic purpose to an individual beyond the expression of the person's own fantasies or personality um, that are excessively cruel, that are thought out and intentional, that are shocking and bewildering in a way that anyone across time and culture would consider horrifying. Uh, for example, in the case of, of what happened to Jody, the fact that this was a crime against the innocence of a child, the fact that it was so calculated. I mean, just as an example, uh, Jody, if I remember the story correctly from when I used to teach it, um, Jeff even dyed your hair and changed your appearance for the for the calculated purpose of, of height. And I think dyed his own beard and then sort of took you off, you know, with this, you know, off to California. And even the idea of, making someone choose to do it would you like to come with me adds to the cruelty it's as if uh, a person is trying to punish someone for being trusting you know you're, you're a fool who trusted me like, just as he once upon a time had been a fool in his own mind for trusting people as a victim himself of, of abuse so now it's projected onto the victim uh so that he's in control and now you're the one who's a, a fool right the, the, all of that, that need to take something that happened to you 
and inappropriately projected onto an innocent person. And then on top of it, this diabolical quality of posing as a friend all comes together to suggest something that the average individual would hear about and say, this is not a sick person. That's evil. It's crafty. It, it was manipulative. It was something that somebody did in the cool light of reason. It was totally outrageous. And I think what really has that, that kind of universality to it is I don't think you could tell your story to anyone, anyone in the world who wouldn't say that it was outrageous and horrifying. And, and that's the interesting thing about evil acts. There's no question about them. Everyone would say that they were. And um, the other thing is what where I think the evil question becomes very interesting in your case is the question of your father. Because in your father's case, committing a homicide had a very different context than somebody who was acting out of malicious, you know, cruelty, but who I think really acted out of a kind of a, a protectiveness and out of a kind of a shock and a horror and a inability to fathom what had happened to children, you know, to a child that he loved. And um, I think at some point tonight, I hope we'll be able to talk about something I've always wondered about, which is how you have come to grips with the fact that that happened and how you if you feel a need to forgive your father or else kind of feel that he did something heroic or or did you feel a kind of attachment to the person who was abusing you like many victims do a kind of a stockholm syndrome or a weird kind of need to protect the the person that that has been hurting you i wondered uh, as i heard your story about all the things that must have been going through your mind at the time as a kid and, um, you know, because I can't tell you how many victims of abuse I've talked to, I'm sure this is true for Anne too, where they they feel a need to protect the, the person who was hurting them. And um, so, uh, but I think as far as the evil question is concerned, I don't think that anybody who heard, heard the story of Jeff Doucette would view him as demented or disturbed or anything like that. I think what he was was a probably personality disordered a pedophile who who had crafted uh, a whole series of ruses to to be able to sexually offend uh and um you know and he probably dealt with what's called a paraphilia which is a, a disorder in which a person achieves uh, sexual gratification from a living thing a living source a person or of a certain type whether they're a child a teenager that's underage a elderly individual uh you know an animal some uh, an infant where they achieve a perverse sexual gratification but i don't think that that means that the individual is sick in the way that their choice is taken away and that we're talking about somebody who didn't know what he was doing um and and that's where i think we have to kind of be careful when we talk about evil versus illness or i think the answer is he made moral choices uh, uh, uh despite um you know that he probably had a paraphilia on top of that now um, but but is it okay if we talk a little bit about the the how you felt about jeff at the time of his death and and about how you felt about your dad doing what he did um because i just can imagine the soup of feeling that you were experiencing at the time and, and jody i want you to answer that question again i just want to uh give a little more broader a little more broad context to this because some people don't know the story so According to reports and what Jody could tell you firsthand is that his father, Gary, was having a drink that night at a bar called the Cotton Club. It was on March 16th, 1984. So we just passed the 39th anniversary. He overheard a local news executive say that Jeff Doucette, uh, this assault, sexual assault or this uh, a pedophile, would arrive in Baton Rouge that night by plane. Uh, when the executive mentioned the exact time, it was 9.08 p.m., Gary made a beeline for the Baton Rouge airport. And uh, according to Jody, who was uh, quoted in many news publications, my dad went to the airport figuring he was going to die. He said either Jeff or him was going to die that night. Um, Jody, I'd love for you to address Gary's question, obviously, but if you want to add a little more context to that, um, about what happened that very fateful evening um, on March 16th, 84. All right. So when my dad was younger, he used to be a cameraman for Channel 2 WBRZ. And Channel 2 was a 
probably less than a half a mile down the road from the Cotton Club. So my dad, he drank with all the guys that worked at uh, Channel 2. So he, he knew all the people. He was on their bowling team. I would go with them on whatever night of the week it was, and I would go with him, and I'd see all these people that would be on TV, and I'd be like, oh, look, these are like local celebrities. So my dad was really good or, or friends with a lot of the people that worked at Channel 2 because he had worked there. My dad said he overheard the conversation, but that's not necessarily the truth. My dad was trying to tech, protect the program director, Bob Shadell. Bob Shadell said, hey, Gary, when are they bringing your boy back? Talking about Jeff. And my dad said, well, they won't tell me. <laughs> I mean, obvious for obvious reasons. He says, as a matter of fact, I think he's back already. And Bob said, no, he's not back. Let me go find out. So he went to the payphone, called Channel 2 and said, what time will do set be back? And he looked at my dad and said, he'll be in at 908 tonight. So I don't think Bob Shadell told my dad that knowing he was going to go shoot him. I think maybe he told my dad that because there would be a confrontation and that would make for good news. Boy, was there a confrontation. Now, at the time, you know, I had that confused child victim mentality and I did feel like Jeff was my best friend. So I was initially upset at what daddy did. I was mad at daddy. I was upset Jeff was dead. Um, but it didn't take long for me to get back. Probably that summer, I forgave daddy. I told him I forgave him. And we just went back to like the relationship we had before we ever met Jeff, you said. So um, it, it took it took a while, but not too, too long. A lot of people, I'll see comments on, uh, it comes up on my Facebook every other week. So I'll see the comments. And someone's like, the sad thing is, is he never spoke to his dad again. And that's, that's not true. Me and my dad had a great relationship. Um, just on the anniversary, someone posted, uh, do you consider your dad a hero? And I said, yeah, but not for the video, not for what you see, not for shooting Jeff. I said, I consider my dad a hero because every man should try to be the man that he was, minus a few drinks and a few girlfriends. Um, How did the I'm, rest of the, the family react to your father? Um, they were obviously more supportive of my father. I mean, I think uh, my sister started crying, said my daddy's going to jail. I think one of my brothers said, good. Um, so I think that they had a, a definitely a different reaction than I did. I just want to hop in with these two comments real quick. Joseph Rapp, do we need a change to laws regarding parents killing the perp who harmed their loved ones? Uh, followed here, uh, Gary, if you want to take this. I got a problem with this being called a murder. Um, is a murder a murder a murder or a murder sometimes not a murder, Gary? Well, the, there should be a distinction made between a homicide and a murder. A homicide means that you have taken a life. Uh, that's the large umbrella under which all killings, including even manslaughter, killings, things like that, go. Um, but then uh, murder, the word murder is used when that homicide is a result of a willful planned act. And so technically speaking, putting a 38 in your boot, you know, and going to an airport with the intention of shooting somebody at close range and exactly what happened um, would be considered a murder. The, the what makes this case a little difficult is, is that there were these kind of extenuating circumstances of somebody being impulsive and overwhelmed with emotion and having been in a what was probably a kind of traumatic state of finding out that your child after this patch of time where for days and days and days where you don't know where he is and then you get this phone call you know i think the the, the idea was that jody was allowed to call his mom and they called collect so they were able to trace it because they were running out of money so jeff had them call collect and then they were able to trace it and kind of pounce on them in a hotel room in california which a big part of i know the traumatic memories for jody of that people coming with guns and kind of breaking in the room and and all that. Um, but but I but I think that it, it's complicated because the word murder would be appropriate. But I think it's like a murder where there are extenuating kind of circumstances we have to think about. And if I remember correctly, it turned out that um, Gary wound up with something like five years of probation or isn't that correct? They, they didn't actually wind up incarcerating him because they had that same sense that this kind of had to be understood in context. Uh, now, and I think it's important also that we be careful that we're not in any way endorsing a kind of vigilante 
justice where you find out that your child has been a victim and so you take your gun and you go out and you take the law into your own hands. But I think at the same time, it's impossible for us not to experience a sympathy. And this is precisely the point when you ask me the question about evil is, is that part of the characteristic of acts that I would call evil is that we can't relate to them as human beings. It would be very difficult to go out there to find an average individual who would say, I can understand what Jeff did, why he would do that to kids. You wouldn't find anybody except people who were disturbed or who were violent themselves. But the average individual could understand what might prompt your father to become so overwhelmed that he would do something like that. Because you think about your children and you do anything for them. You, you could absolutely kill for them. And um, so that I understand now. Uh, but but Jody, um, I was just talking a little bit about um, when you sort of clicked out there for a second. I don't know if you heard about. Oh, you did. So that that was I correct in those facts that that the reason he got caught was because of calling collect. And that so that that means that if I understand correctly, there were like days and days that your father and mother were sitting around stewing in this question of where is he and who is he with and what happened to him or whatever. But didn't they know that you went off to California with Jeff or did they not know that? So that was a story told to you and your parents were never told we're going to take we're gonna, I'm going to take your son off to California. He, you were just taken from the karate place or something. Well, no, Jeff's brother had dropped him off at the house, and he asked my mom to borrow the car because one of the other karate student, his his family was building a, a brand new house, and Jeff's brother has a carpet business. So Jeff was like, "Oh, I'm going to go make sure the carpet was delivered. Come ride with me, Jody." And so that's when we ended up. He ended up taking me to Port Arthur, Texas. Um, that was a Sunday, and we got uh, bus tickets from to California on Tuesday, and we left that Tuesday. But he was, and so my mother and dad went one week without hearing from me. And it was one week when he allowed me to call home. Um, but he was saying we were in New York, but we were really in California. But I, I want to say one thing about the whether it's murder. I, I don't have a problem with people saying what my dad did was murder because, I mean, it was. By definition, it was murder. But the one thing that makes me proud or makes me happy is, one, my dad is a symbol of justice. And people view that as an act of love, not as an act of evil. You know, so they don't they don't look at it like, oh, this man is just murdering this guy. They're seeing a father protecting his family. And that's that's kind of what, you know, makes me proud. And I want to ask well, you, I, I have t three children and one is a boy who's turning four. I can't say that I would uh, act any differently if I found out this was happening. I think I would be completely enraged. Um, the truth is, I'd probably be too scared to be, if I'm being perfectly honest, to do what Gary did. Um, but it wouldn't be that I didn't want to do it. So how do you how do you negotiate all this if you find out that your children are being abused in this horrific way? It takes their innocence from them. Well, you have to look at each situation. And I think you identified some of the things. This is a, uh, Gar Gary knew this man. So this wasn't a stranger and probably knew him even more than we realize. Um, I think Jody would have to answer that. And that it was the decision had to be made pretty quickly. Um, although I think what you're saying, Jody, is there was some prelude to this that in some way they knew that Jeff had had you with him. And so even though they knew you were kidnapped. Did they feel, I wonder if that was a period of time where they, Gary really developed some feelings and some intensity as to what he might do if he, if he found you. Do you think that was at all going on in his mind? I, I don't think they ever thought Jeff would like, I don't want to say harm me because I mean, but most people would look at what he did to me was harm. As far as like when I say horn, like I don't think they thought Jeff was going to kill me or anything like that. But I will say this. My dad was very good to Jeff. As a matter of fact, the reason why Jeff left town is because he owed my dad's friend money that my dad, Jeff was trying to do this business and he owed my dad's friend money. And that's why he ended up leaving town. Um, my dad literally, Jeff had stayed over. It was a Saturday night and we did Sunday dinner at my grandparents' house. We went and dropped Jeff off at the karate school because that's where he was living. 
And as we left the karate school, my dad didn't make it to the light, and he's just crying. And I'm like, what is wrong? And he's like, he's so pitiful. My dad turned the car around, went, said, Jeff, come on down, brought him home, gave him fresh clothes to wear, let him shower, and brought him to my grandparents' house for a Sunday dinner that we did every Sunday. Um, you know, so my dad was very good to Jeff. And when I was kidnapped, that's when they started putting pieces together. That's when, you know, Mike Barnett was over at the house pretty much 24-7. And my little brother starts telling stories about this one time. I, I, I peeked into the window and I saw Jeff and Jody on the bed. And so they, they went to my mother. Uh, Mike Burnett and my dad went to my mother. And they said, all right, Mikey, tell uh, your mom what you just told us. And my mother was like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that right now. I'm worried about getting my son back. When I get my son back, then I can worry about that other stuff. But right now, my concern is getting him back. So, um, you know, Jeff was, I mean, daddy was very good to Jeff. Well, and what you just said, I think, is really, really important that put your father into conflict because here he befriended him and he did all these things. And then when he ever hears what has happened, that was a blow. I would think that was uh, it's not like he had planned anything or thought it out. It, it had to have been a very quick decision of what he was going to do so and you said he was sitting in the he was having a drink in a bar and it comes on the radio or the television and does he know at that time or he just wanted to go and what what, what was the reason that he ran to the, the airport the, well the guy tipped him off it was, it was actually at lunch um so it was the friday march 16th and I think in my dad's deposition he was like it definitely was a friday because i was eating gumbo because friday was like gumbo day because it's lent or, you know, it's around the Linton time, so they serve gumbo on Friday. And, uh, you know, when he had that knowledge, he actually, all right, so my grandparents picked us up that day, that afternoon, and brought us to our camp. We had a, a, a camp out on, it's called False River, but it's really an Oxbow Lake from the Mississippi River. And we went out there. My dad made it out there, and he stopped off at the convenience store out at False River and called his best friend, uh, Jim Adams. And he was talking to Jim, and finally... He was like, you know what? He turned the car around and he went back to the airport, called Jim from the airport. And I just found this out the other day um, on the anniversary. Jim Adams called the sheriff's department and said, look, my friend is at the airport. He's got a gun. He is going to shoot the man who kidnapped his son. And I always wondered why Jim did that. Well, his son told me he was worried about the cops killing my dad. So he didn't want my dad to be killed. That's why he tried to warn um, the sheriff's office. Well, he, the sheriff's uh, deputy called Jim Adams back and said, look, we can't get in touch with Mike Barnett. And Jim was the one my dad was actually talking on the phone with. People go, oh, he's pre pretending to be on the phone. No, he wasn't. He was talking to his best friend, and his best friend heard the shot. So when the sheriff's deputy called him back, he said, it's too late. I heard the shot. And so that deputy left and went up to the airport. And that's where the title of the book comes from, your book, Why Gary? Why? Because that's what the sheriff's deputy said to him right after he fired that shot. Um, Debbie Olander writes, Dr. Gary, uh, this is for you, Dr. Gary, what is the definition of grooming? I heard it used in the Zach Anderson trial by his daughter the other day, which seemed to broaden the term from what I thought it was. Uh, we'll get to that. To You can talk about uh, grooming here, Gary, but this next comment, too. Uh, Jody, you have all my respect. Fellow survivor here it takes such courage to speak and heal. It will help so many people. I was in a group for survivors and it was powerful to hear the men's stories. Um, so thank you, Jody, for speaking out. Uh, but Gary, is there a uh, fast definition on grooming? You mentioned it off the top as well. Well, an end could certainly speak to this also, of course. Uh, Grooming is a process by which an individual coerces uh, and kind of gains access to and gradually breaks down the boundaries with an individual that is being targeted. Um, and um, that process usually happens in a pretty patterned way. It can happen online or it can happen in person. Uh, now that we've got the internet, there's new forms of this, right? Since the internet has been around. Um, but usually the idea is, is that a person coming in the form as a me of a mentor or a friend will latch on sometimes even to an entire family. I've even heard about cases where 
someone will even become romantically involved with someone because they have encountered that person's child or children that they would like to eventually groom. So they will be involved with the adult parent to get to the children or child. Uh, and um, so that th this individual will usually isolate the person and begin to give them gifts and share secrets with them. Because in doing that, you're testing the loyalty and the privacy that you're now developing with the individual. And um, one of the techniques is to give an incredible sense of, of specialness to the individual to make them feel that they are in on a very secret kind of private relationship so that they won't even share it with parents and so forth. Then there is a gradual breaking down of a desensitization to uncomfortable things. First, sometimes showing pornography or adult magazines, uh, saying, come sit on my lap, uh, you know, putting your hand on the person in increasingly inappropriate ways, right? To kind of, you know, wrestling, uh, let's play a game, you know, right, exactly. Look at sound, you know, let's take a shower together, that kind of thing. Um, and um, and then gr gradually that's broken down. And then this kind of attempt to normalize increasingly sexually perverse acts. So that then at that point, the child is now in a total state of confusion because they've come to love and trust this person. And the person is normalizing to them, like, this is just what people do when they love each other like and they have kind of a secret friendship with each other but you probably shouldn't tell people because they wouldn't understand the way that we do that kind of thing uh and um it it's it's really horrifying when you think about it. but i think um jeff um you know was somebody who had really kind of turned this into an art uh he had probably done this a lot uh and um it, the other thing is i think you know to think about that with pedophiles and i think he Jeff would clearly fall into the category of pedophile, that they're to be distinguished from hebophiles, who are people who prefer teenagers, but who are still under age. Uh, but someone who, like someone who was the age you were, um, Jody, would be clearly a pedophile. Uh, and um, with pedophiles, you know, it's an interesting thing. They, unlike, let's say, serial killers, they don't really have the opportunity to go around and hunt for the ideal imagined victim in the way that like a serial killer might a lot of times it's more about access just who do i who can i get my hands on at this particular moment and um so but um but jody is there anything in that kind of description that really kind of rang true to the experience that you had it it, it all rang true i mean Jeff didn't just groom me, he grew my family. Um, I, there was one incidence where early on, he told my parents that the reason why he loves kids so much is because he can't have his own because he had an accident climbing the fence and basically gave himself a bisectomy. And so he had this accident when he was younger. And so early on, he told my parents that, and that just kind of takes all that out of their, their thought process, you know? So if they notice something that might be weird, um, it doesn't register. One of the things that he let me do was drive. That's why I, I did the driving thing. And he would put me in his lap. Another thing, he would stretch us. And I just got through watching an episode of SVU. So, you know, what does a, a sexual assault victim do for a uh, spare time? They watch rape shows. But um, so I was watching SVU, and there was one episode that actually had Mike Tyson in it. And it was a guy stretching out this little kid, and he was putting his hands on his thigh and inner thigh and uh, – that's what Jeff used to do. I mean, he would, that's how he kind of normalized, you know, kind of getting close to my private parts. Um, and it's a slow process. And I, I, I hate to say this, but you know, pedophiles who offend are really good at what they do. I mean, look at Jerry Sandusky, Jerry Sandusky had a foundation where the children and youth were being referred to him. These, these at risk children were being referred to him and he was molested them. So, I mean, they're really good at what they do. Um, Brianna writes, I'm curious where his father is today. Gary Plouche is no longer with us, but Jody, a lot of people uh, tell us uh, what year did your father die? Also, people are confused. Did he ever serve any time or he was. Uh, uh, he shot him on a Friday night and he couldn't post bail till Monday morning. And so he spent a couple days in jail, Paris prison. Um, then he went to a psych ward for about a month where he was evaluated and then he came home and, uh, you know, uh, he died in 2014. He actually, 
his last interview um, we did we did a, a ESPN E60 in 2013, and so my dad did an interview. And actually, in that E60, I was wearing this shirt, so I kind of wore this as a tribute to the last interview that I did before my dad died. Did Did anyone ever ask him if he had any regrets uh, as he was getting on in years and ready to leave the world? Well, he, he did, and his his answer was he regrets the whole situation happened. Um, but then I always the follow up question and he was on Sally, Jesse, Raphael, and I love it. Um, I got this clip and she's like, you don't, you don't believe in taking the law in your own hands. Do you? And my dad's like, no, I do not. And she's like, but you would do it again. He's like, yes, I would. So no, he, he never admitted that. He, I mean, he did, uh, you know, he was, he was a raised Catholic. So he didn't, he, you know, like I said, he believed in eight of the 10 commandments. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Like, how should I commit adultery? But, uh, and it, it bothered him that he took a human life, but it didn't bother him that he stepped up to what he felt he had to do to defend his family. Let, let me ask one more simple question and I'll toss it back to uh, it's the reporter in me. I can't help myself. But um, Jody, how are you so normal or seemingly normal after going all through I, all this? All right. So go, going back to my mother, well, Let's go back to when I was five years old. I, I was out at my older brother's football practice. You know, it was uh, like little league football. And our neighbor, he was a little older. So they had like the peewees, the juniors, and the seniors. All right. So it's like, you know, the seven, eight year olds, the nine, 10 year olds, and the 11, 12 year old. So I went over to see my neighbor, and some of his friends were telling me all this, you know, perverted, you know, stuff about sex, the birds and the bees. And so I came home at five years old and I told my mother. And she was like, oh, oh, dear God. So we had a conversation when I was five years old about not in depth, but she tried to like, that's not how it works. You know, you know, so I think that that helped. And another thing she would do is she would make us watch. She would make us watch after school specials and, and movies of the week or, or the, the Tuesday night movie. And I remember watching something for Joey about Joey, John Capaletti winning the Heisman Trophy and giving the brother his trophy to his dying brother. And we watched another one called Fallen Angel. And I think that was in 81. And it was about child pornography. And my mother explained to me that there are grownups out there that will take advantage of children and will do bad things to them. And if anyone ever does that to you, let me know. So the first time Jeff put his hand in my lap when I was driving the car, I was like, uh-oh. And I, I thought it was an accident, but I also thought maybe he could be like one of those people mommy told me about. And so that was going through my mind. So I think that the fact that I had prior knowledge I never blamed myself for any maybe physical pleasure I had when he was performing oral sex on me. I never said, oh, I'm wrong. I shouldn't be feeling good. I didn't know it was going to feel good until he did it. So I think that that's kind of, again, I got to give the credit to my mother. I think that that's kind of what allowed me to get through all this. I didn't have to keep it a secret for 20 years because daddy blew his brains out. I didn't have to run around worrying about seeing him at the grocery store. That never happened to me. So I think that all of that contributes to why I think I was able to turn out okay. Now, I will say this, and, and we, we mentioned it earlier, I do not advocate vigilante justice. I do not advocate um, parents taking the law in their own hands or seeking revenge on the perpetrator. If you want to do a case study, look at Ellie Nessler. Ellie Nessler shot her son's abuser in the courthouse, ended up serving time in jail, and now he's in jail for the rest of his life. So um, it's better. And, and then look at Cain Velasquez, the MMA fighter. Um, you know, he spent nine months in jail and he learned that it's better for a parent to be there for their child than to get revenge. By the way, I'm, I'm a big MMA fan. What do you think is going to happen to him? I mean, he's pending. It's pending trial, right? I, I hope they I hope the justice system actually does justice. I mean, he made a mistake. He shot the wrong guy. So, uh, you know, he needs he needs some punishment. And I think that if he gets credit for time served and community service, I think that would do a lot more good for, you know, everybody than him going to jail for 20 years and for those of you who don't know Cain Velasquez was a UFC heavyweight champ multiple times one of the meanest toughest guys you'll ever see uh, but took the law into his own hands after finding out a similar story about his own child and again he did he he shot at a car ended up hitting the wrong person a relative of the person that was doing it um, and was just recently let out of prison um Mia Angelina writes, you guys are all icons. Dr. Ann Burgess, you're an inspiration to women and everyone. Thank you uh, for your time. Um, 
There's another comment here I saw that I wanted to pop up, and now I can't find it. But I will put uh, give the floor back to Ann here um, and see where – Jody, go ahead. I got a question for Ann. Ann, do you uh, know Jim Clementi? Yes, I do. All right, so, yeah, he actually – um, we were on a TV show. We weren't together, but we were on the same show talking about my dad. And I emailed him a copy of my book before it came out. And he sat down and he went through and he edited the whole thing. Like he, he made changes and gave me statistics. And so he was a big help. And actually, I did an a interview with his company talking about the Kane Velasquez situation. So, uh, yeah, I, I love Jim. Yes. Um, his, his paternal report about the whole uh, Jerry Sandusky situation changed my whole mindset on Joe Paterno and how his role in the, that whole molestation case. Um, and I could, if you've never read the, I'm, I'm talking to the people watching, if you've never read the Clemente report, go read it. It's excellent. Yeah. Well, you've named two very, very important people to you that really did help you get through this. And that's your mom and that's Jim and Jim Clemente is a, uh, is a star. He really is. And it's good to hear that he was involved uh, with you and, and supportive of your work. Uh, Black Black Witter writes, how do, you, how do you feel okay about letting your child out into the world? I feel very anxious when my son's walking home from school, et cetera. I've been hyper vigilant since having him really. Uh, Jody, any words of advice? I, I don't have kids and I don't let my cat out. So um, I, I, I would be very cautious on who my, my children were around. Now, you can't and, – and let me say this. I have great memories of spending the night with my cousins, going to Dallas and hanging out with them, with my grandparents, um, spending the night with teammates and classmates. Um, so I don't want to say don't allow it, but be very careful. And my mother even called to, uh, her brother who worked for the sheriff's department before we ever went to the movies with Jeff and said, can you run a background check on him? And that's what you had mentioned earlier, Gary, that, you know, it wasn't on his record, you know, or either my uncle didn't check it, but it, it wasn't on his record. So, uh, you know, I, just be very careful and, and, and talk to your children. Again, that's, I think, what got me through it. My mother, having talked to us, educated me. In, in, in my book, I mentioned, uh, I keep forgetting, commit, it wasn't Committee for Children, um, No Place Like Home. If you type in no place like home, uh, sex education online, you can you can get these. And it tells you at five, a child should be able to know this. By six, they should be able to know this. By seven, they should know this. Um, by 18, they should have already done it. Um, but educate your children. Talk to your children. You can be protected, but still allow them to have a good time and, and be kids. Jody, did you... Uh make it a conscious decision not to have children was it personal decision. I mean, I know it's a very personal thing to discuss, but uh, is it because of what happened that you thought maybe I shouldn't have children? All right. So I forget the year. It had to be like 95. Yeah. It was 1994. Um, it was father's day and me and my brother and my friend, we were in the swimming pool and uh, I made a bet with my brother that he couldn't swim the length of the pool underwater. All right, well, he wanted to show me up, and so he decided he was going to go twice. Well, he ends up passing out underwater. And me and my friend, we're not paying attention, and we're just talking. And we notice that, you know, Mikey's being quiet. I, I look down, and I see him floating at the bottom of the pool, and he's, he's kind of doing like this. And I'm just watching him carefully, and he went. And I, that's why I knew he had passed out underwater. So I jumped up, I grabbed him, I pulled him up, I gave him mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Um, and when you see on the TV where, like, someone gets mouth-to-mouth -mouth when they drown, and they go and they spit up a little water, <laughs> that's not what happened. It's a lot. And so my mother was in Biloxi, and I had to call her, so she drove the two hours back home because she had just left that day. She drove the two hours back home, and she was sitting outside smoking a cigarette probably at midnight, and she was like, if you ever want to have another good night, or if you want to have good night's sleep for the rest of your life, don't ever have a kid. And I was like, you know what? It sounds like pretty good advice. So uh, – I just never wanted them. I don't want that headache. I don't want that worry. I don't want another person to, to worry about or, or care about. I don't want to go through what daddy went through. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Sherry's news writes, uh, does Jody go and talk with students in schools, prisons? Do you uh, speak about this? Obviously you're speaking to us right now, but um, is it kind of 
your life's mission to talk about this and how to prevent this from happening? When I was at Victim Services Center, we would go into elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, colleges, professional trainings. Um, I got a speaking engagement coming up here in Richmond, Virginia at a sex offender treatment conference. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, my goal, I, I would do it every day if I could. Um, so my goal is to, I just, I just got, I start every speech with, I thank you for having me. Um, my friend, she used to live in Naperville, Illinois. And she was like, why don't you come to my son's school and, and talk about keeping touch and safe and healthy? And I said, well, one, I have to be invited. Cause if I walk into an elementary school and talk, start talking about touching a child's private parts, I'm getting arrested. So, um, I do, I have, and I, I hope to continue to do so. Do kids ever ask you questions when you go in and talk with them? When, when I was at Victim Services Center, our company policy was not to disclose personal information. So when people would ask me, well, you know, did anything happen to you? I would say, well, it's our policy not to disclose. But when I was in college, I would, did men against violence. And so that's how I kind of skated around the, you know, personal story. Um, but, but now if I were to go into a high school, I would share my personal story. Um, this one here from Millie Loves God. How do we encourage boys to speak up if we suspect abuse? Do you have an? Is there an answer to that, Jody? Um, we we discussed earlier about how it's you know probably more difficult for boys to come forward, especially if they're being abused by a male. I would say you could go the route that they did with me. I mean, if you suspect abuse, take them to get a physical examination. Go you know get a a, a physical performed where you do. Uh, a rape kid. I mean, I don't know if that's probably, and you might disagree with that, but I mean, there's medical ways to finding out. Well, certainly there are. Um, you'd have to though have a complaint to get into, to, to have them do that. That's uh, so you're still going to have to have the boy say something unless you're just doing a general, just a general physical. Just a general, well, then that should be a routine question that's asked. And if the parent comes with the with the child, they should be asked about any behavior that seems a little bit unusual. A change in behavior always can signify something. So there are some warning signs that have existed. I don't know if that would have happened in your case. What do you think? If, if the, your mother had taken you to just a general checkup. Well, I will say this. You, you pointed on the number one thing that I... I say when people ask me, you know, should your parents have known? Now, let's remember, this is 1983. People didn't talk about this stuff back then. But due to my personality change, I was always outgoing. I was always at the grown-up table. I was in the grown-up conversation, listening to daddy's jokes. Um, I played football, basketball, baseball, soccer. And then Jeff made me quit all that. So by me loving all these sports and quitting and then just kind of not sitting with the grown-up tables but sitting next to Jeff on the couch watching a movie the personality changing me right now to me would be the biggest th biggest thing if you watch the video of me coming home in uh, New Orleans uh, I got on a red like windbreaker I look like a child who had been sexually abused for a year and kidnapped I mean I look like my body language that I see that when I watch that so should they have known no because they didn't know about it back then but you know, if you read my book, Why Gary, Why, you'll, I, I give tips that parents can use to, you know, help. I don't want to say, you know, it would make all the difference in the world, but I mean, at least it, it puts you ahead of the curve. Sure. Very good. Thank uh, you. Francis Foley here writes, oh, I'm from Naperville. Wasn't expecting to hear that town of all places. Wish we would have gotten the chance to hear you speak uh, when I was in school. Uh, this is an interesting comment here from David Mars. I'll never forget how happy my dad was when this came on the news in 1984, uh, followed by, we all know this, uh, Gary is fabulous. And I think they're talking about Gary Bricado, uh, not Gary Plush Plushe. So uh, uh, suppose both Gary's are, uh, are fabulous, but Gary, I want to ask you a question. So, uh, Jody and I are roughly the same age. I'm a few years older than Jody. I think he was born in 72. I was born in 69. When I was in high school, I was a subpar baseball player. I was always a decent athlete, but baseball, I could not hit a ball. I'm not going to mention names because it could be sensitive to people I know. But there was a guy who coached 
a baseball team. And this baseball team was very, very well known in town because if you played for him, you got full uniforms, brand new cleats every year. He would take kids to spring training. He had a batting cage at his house. Um, he was a sports writer in our small town. Uh, he was an alumnus of the year. Um, he was a very heavy set man um, with surrounded by big Doberman pinchers. Um, and I remember he would just feed them slabs of meat. Um, he was a big, big guy. Um, I'll never forget this. My mother said to me, he, re he recruited me to be on the team. Um, and my mother said, there is no way in hell. My mother's a therapist. My dad's a retired psychiatrist. There is no way in hell that you're playing for him. Not a chance in hell. And I remember being so upset. I wanted to play. You get free access to the batting cage, all these things. Sure enough, a couple of years later, came from a very, you know, uh, town that's next to a university. A lot of the parents were professors. Kids going to Harvard and Yale who had just gotten in, they all, uh, it all came out that they were all uh, being abused sexually by this person. It became a huge story. He went to prison. Uh, fractured the town. How common is this? And I mean, in retrospect, it seems obvious to me, and I love Jody to weigh on this too, but so many parents wanted their kids to have that cool uniform to be recruited by him, uh, to play on the team that everyone wanted to be a part of, to take those trips to spring training in Florida. Um, it was without batting an eye where my mother said, there's just no way you're having anything to do with this guy. She didn't care how annoyed, how sad, how upset I was. But I'm just wondering, how common is this? Well, well first of all, it's, oh, go ahead, Ann. Please answer. No, no, I was going to say, just real quickly, more common than you expect. Because parents are not don't have it in their heads that my, this coach or this whichever would possibly do do anything sexual to my child they're not thinking of that with boys and that's why boys have to come forward so we get better understanding of this um that's all i wanted to say go ahead gary yeah no no i i mean in terms of the general statistics on sexual assault of males first of all the, the statistics are totally biased because we don't know how many males are not telling us what happens to them um but the estimate is something like one out of every 10 sexual assaults or rapes in the United States are against males, um, which, and it, and it sort of amounts to something like one in 33, one in 33 males having experienced some form of sexual violence at some point in their lives, uh, which is lower than the rates you would see in females, but questionable uh, to me. I, I think there is a minimization. One of the things that I, think about a lot in the story of, of Jody that even when I used to teach it, people would ask is, did you know that you were being abused? At what point in the, because when you're that young, you probably don't even know what's going on there. At what point did you say, I am really uncomfortable and something is going on here that's weird? Because there's a lot of talk of why don't you go home and tell your family and all that. But what's hard about it when you talk to people who are victims is that at first they're totally confused, which I think is precisely the point to, to sort of get you to a place where you're so confused about whether the person loves you or is their friend or your friend or doing something with you that's supposed to be mutually enjoyable and some, you know, th at least that's the fantasy of what they want you to believe. So at what point did you say, okay, something is wrong here. What Did it take a while or did you know right away? Again, thankfully for my mother explaining to me that there were people out there. I mean, the first time he put his hands in my lap, I was like, uh-oh, is this he, he one of these people? And then uh, we were going crawfishing one night. So we got a hotel room and it was, I mean, it was probably eight of us. I mean, four boys in one bed and four in the other, me and Jeff. Um, but Jeff put me, Jeff put himself as like, he put me on the end, then he put himself here, and then there were other two boys here. So he was able to, like, turn his back to the other two boys, and then he could do whatever he wanted with me. And that's, that's the night when I realized, okay, these touches hasn't been, haven't been accidental. He's doing this on purpose because he, he literally he rubbed, 
he rubbed me all night long. And it, literally, I was pretending to be asleep. And the next day, we went to the store to get something. And he asked me, he's like, do you tell your parents what I do? And I, I was trying to pretend like I was asleep. So I pretended like I didn't know what he was talking about. And I was like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And I think that's the moment when he knew that he had me because that's when he started progressing and going to more. He went from oral sex to then anal sex. And that, that's kind of like the key moment where he knew he had me. Right. And, and then, um, and thank you, uh, Jody, I know how hard it is to talk about these details and uh, I can't imagine um, the, the way you talk about them with such comfort. That it's, it must be a lot of years that you're, you're living this. When, when your dad shoots, them, yeah. when your dad shoots your perpetrator on national TV, it, it, it becomes a little easier 39 years later. Yeah. Right. Well, but um, but another thing that I I wanted to ask you about, that I've always wanted to ask you about with this case is, you know, when I, you know, people like Anne and me study how people groom children and and to bring them into these offenses, one of the things I've learned talking to parents of children that are abused is that one of the things that helps them trust someone who goes on to groom their child is that that person has relationships. They're married, they have a wife, they have a partner, whatever. Did, did Jeff have a partner? Did he have anyone in his life at all? Or was he kind of a loner, somebody where in the neighborhood people might have said, strange guy, he doesn't have any relationships, he's always got kids around him. Or did he have a, a partner? When we first met Jeff, he, he had Claire, his girlfriend, but it wasn't really his girlfriend. It was kind of like his front. And I even think at one point, uh, my mother and Claire were talking and Claire was like, you know, Jeff just doesn't seem to be interested in me. So, I mean, even my mother wouldn't have looked at that as like a red flag, but I, I looking back, you go, Oh wow. That's a red flag. Cause Claire was just kind of like his front. Um, he, she had a 280 ZX and that was the car I was driving. And, you know, it was always, Oh, Jeff's car, but it was always Claire's car. But then, I guess Claire got done with him. Um, and then after that, he was pretty much alone. Right. And see, and the, and the other thing this raises, and it gets into a controversial topic, but it's important, is that, like, for example, I was listening recently to an interview of a, of a Roman Catholic priest where he was asked the question about the, the abuse of children uh, in, in the church over history and so forth. And he said something like, well, the key is that we need to root homosexuality out of the church. And the interesting thing is, statistically speaking, pedophiles don't tend to be gay. They tend to target opposite sex uh, partners, and it's hebophiles that tend to be more gay, according to the statistics. Uh, so that's an interesting thing, is, is that a lot of times people say, well, how could he be a child molester? He, he's, he's got a wife. He's got a girlfriend. I don't think of him that way. But the truth is, is that that's not that uncommon. Uh, is there any reason to believe that the girlfriend that he had thought that anything was going on there? Or was she just as shocked when she found out about her partner? I She wasn't around whenever, like, I, I, I don't, I, I mean, I'd probably the first two or three months that we were taking karate from Jeff is whenever uh, he was supposedly dating her. Um, so I don't even know what her thoughts would be. But I will say this. Maybe it's just because I'm, I'm too vested into this topic, but I, I love the fact that you draw the difference between pedophile and hebophile because I get, I get mad when people go, oh, look at that, uh, having sex with a 15-year-old, that pedophile. I'm like, that's not a pedophile. That's a hebophile. Get it right. Or Kelly is not a pedophile. Or Kelly is a hebophile. He likes 14, 15-year-olds. So I, I, I do appreciate the fact that you make that distinction. And I well, will well, say yeah, another thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, please. Yeah, I will say. One other thing, um, and I mentioned it in my book, you had mentioned earlier about like dating or, or women with, you know, pedophiles targeting women with children. It, it, it bothers me when I go to like uh, some type of uh, dating site where it's like, I'm a proud mother of three little girls. Well, a pedophile is going to swipe right on that because he's trying to get to them through her. Um, so parents, be careful with what you post on social media it, it, all the time because you never know who's looking at that. Well, well you remember, Jody, the, the very famous book by Nabokov, uh, Lolita. And in, in the book Lolita, the idea is, is that the, the central character marries a woman 
only after encountering her 13-year-old daughter, uh, where the idea is, is that he's having a relationship with that woman purely to groom the, the 13-year-old daughter, and then eventually runs off with her to a hotel and takes her on the run. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there are a lot of echoes in that story, if you were to read Lolita, um, you know, with the shooting and everything, right, uh, that, that are really reminiscent of your own story, uh, actually. Uh, but, but, but the thing is, you know, that, that concept of grooming, I think, you know, you see traces of it in the literature going back a while. But it was really when you were a kid, you were in that generation where experts, people like Ken Lanning, somebody that that Ann and I know, who's really one of the leading authorities on child abuse in the in, in the you know I think in the world, um, really started to define that and to think about it and to you know and I think the work you do is just so important. Uh, and um, tell a little bit about some of this advocacy work you do, and um, you know stories of you know how you've really kind of helped change some lives and so that people know about the groups you work with and where they might be able to, you know, learn a little bit about it or make donations or whatever. I mean, what, where, where are these places you work? If, uh, if, if you look at the forward of my book, all right, my best friend, Dave wrote the forward of my book and he describes a, a road trip me and him took to a speaking engagement I had in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And I was the final keynote speaker at this conference, but I also did a, a breakout session and I used the work of Ken Lanning and I had it, it was a typology of molesters, right? So I used kind of his work and, and I put his name to credit it. Well, somebody uh, mistakenly thought that I was him. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not Kid Lanning. I'm like, he's, he's much more qualified than I am. But um, uh, I'm on the board for the Louisiana Foundation Against Sexual Assault. Um, I, I served my time at uh, Victim Services Center. Uh, one of the greatest, oh, one of the best things ever. And that's when, in, so in 1998, I got hired at Victim Services Center. I, I was living in urban Texas, and I moved to uh, Royersburg, Pennsylvania, but Victim Services is in Norristown. And when I was going through my 40 hours of sexual assault counselor training, that's when I learned about rape trauma syndrome, and that's when I first heard about Anne. So, like, this is an honor for me, uh, even though I did step on her foot, it's an honor for me to, to be interviewed. And uh, you, know, you know who else I had a lunch with? We had a training at Victim Services Center. And it was a two-day training. And it was uh, Roy Hazelwood. And I got to have lunch with Roy Hazelwood, too. So um, it, it's kind of kind of cool. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Well, you can step on my foot anytime, Jody. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm open to, you know, again, I – my goal is to, you know, to travel around, raising awareness. Um, and if I could do that every day, that's what I would do. I'd um, have to bring and, Lola with me. Yeah. And is there such a thing as uh, textbook uh, pedophilia? Um, because uh, Jody wrote at one point, so I didn't say anything, but now I know he was testing the boundaries. Textbook pedophilia, they all test boundaries. Um, is there such a thing as textbook pedophilia? Well, sure, there has to be because they don't want to be caught. So they have to see how far they can go. And so I think that the example that Jody gave is very, very instructive. And he figured out that he wasn't going to tell. And he passed the test, if you will, um, at that point. He also knew, Jeff also played the, the parents very well. He's very controlling on what information, how to keep information from not only Jody, but the family. Um, I, I was wondering if anybody in the family was surprised or not surprised when it came out about what Jeff was doing. Well, there was a situation where we fought in a, a karate tournament in Fort Worth, Texas. Well, my dad's brother, my uncle Jeff, he lived in Dallas. So they had made arrangements to where we were going to spend a couple of days visiting my, my aunt and uncle and my cousin. And when Jeff Doucette dropped us off to go be picked up by Jeff, close Uncle Jeff, Jeff Doucette kissed me on the mouth. Like he gave me a, excuse me, a tongue kiss. And my uncle saw it. And my uncle went to my dad and said, look, something's not right with this relationship. Um, you know, I don't even kiss my kids on the mouth. He should not be kissing your kid on the mouth. And my dad, who had been groomed by Jeff, was like, no, Jeff's just very affectionate. You know, he... 
you know, you just don't understand how Jeff is. So my dad had even had them blinders on because okay. Jeff had groomed him. So, but my uncle saw it. My uncle did warn my dad that this relationship wasn't right. Yeah. Yeah. He, he couldn't put Yeah. He probably didn't realize that uh, your uncle was there or he didn't, he didn't think about it. Or maybe that was another test to see whether anybody would say anything. He just didn't care. Jeff, I would say um, Jeff was truly a sociopath. Like he had no empathy, no key that he didn't care about anybody else. He would screw anybody over for his own benefit. I mean, he truly was, uh, he was, truly was psychotic, yeah. if that's the right term. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry to use those terms in front of y'all. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you raised this point, uh, Jody, because as I was, you know, over the years, as I have read about this case, I always thought that that Jeff Doucette was probably a psychopath, probably in that spectrum of being a psych, not psychotic, but a psychopath. And um, one of the things I have always wanted to ask you is, did you ever see him get violent? In other words, where you thought that he might progress from sexual crimes to something like murder? Or did he seem purely interested in sexual violence, sexual abuse, but no violence at all? Was he a passive person or somebody that would get where there were moments where the mask would fall away and you realize this person could really hurt you? The only thing that I can tell you, because... Um, it, you know, it, I left this part out of the book and if it ever turns into a, a documentary or a movie, um, we've already filmed it, but I know for a fact that he escalated and got really violent. One day, one day we came home from school and my mother said, if I'm murdered, Jeff did it. And so this was right around the time before he kidnapped me. I guess it was his way of trying to control her so that she wouldn't call the police if he did take me because he kind of had in his mind he was going to leave and take take me. And so I he, he definitely roughed her up. That's that's about as, more, as much as I can say because it's not my uh, story Steve, to tell. This does not surprise me at all because, you see, the you asked about the textbook pedophile or, or the question was raised to the textbook. And I think if we think in the kind of Ken Lanning way about this, there really seem to be two buckets, right? There are the socially inept type that have to snatch a child because they can't talk to them there's no seductive ability you know no grooming ability so you just sort of take a kid off the street and drive off and and then there's the type the more seductive psychopathic sometimes sadistic type that charms and grooms and manipulates and so forth and that is where you start thinking about the kind of personality that might seek greater and greater amusement through escalating violence. And, you know, I, I always found myself wondering, I said, I almost feel like this guy could have progressed to being somebody who, because at first he's trying to get you to keep your mouth shut. But at some point, some of these people say, maybe I'll just get rid of the victim. I mean, if, if for example, God forbid, if they hadn't called, he hadn't called collect and he just kept staying with you at length, what would have been what would have eventually happened? Would he have basically tried to get rid of? He would have. He would have. He probably would have been the uh, the well. I guess human trafficking has been around for a long time. It just wasn't called called that. But you know, I mean, he had mentioned uh, doing to me what his mother, what he claimed his mother had done to him, finding somebody who would pay to have sex with me. You mean that he would have prostituted you? Yes. And he, 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 he brought it, he brought it up. So this really was a, I mean, this is a psychopathic person, obviously. And uh, the, so that, that the idea is, um, did he have to your knowledge, the kind of history you would see in a psychopath, like years of getting arrested for things, theft or steal Like, for example, when you got, I know his record was expunged, but when you guys like, for example, were, were hungry because he, he had run out of money he obviously impulsively planned this trip with you. Didn't think that through, right? Was he shoplifting? Was he finding clever ways to get money? What was he doing? You know, you're pretty smart. I'll tell you what he did. He would write a hot check. So what he did was he took his checkbook and he wrote a check out to my mother. And then he would have me sign the back of the check, maybe like 10 times. So he'd write a $20 check and he'd have me sign it. And then he'd go, oh, wait, that's not good enough. Here, let me write another one. So he had like these, you know, 10, 
twenty dollar checks written out to my mother that I had signed that he would go cash. Yeah, this was a this was a piece of work. This guy, the most amazing oh, he, thing though, yeah, I mean he clearly he he had what we call criminal versatility. He was this was not someone purely committing sexual offenses. He was capable of a lot of things. Right. I'll tell so, you what so I that, have a. I have a note that he wrote to my mother. I mean, literally like a couple of weeks before he kidnapped me. I, I'm willing to scan it. I don't know how legible it is. I mean, because it's, you know, 40 years old. But I'll send it to you and let you read it just so you can see how. I mean, he was almost like, I don't want to say bipolar, but, you know, in one minute he's all loving. And, you know, I wish I had the life that you and Gary had. You've got children and I don't have that in my life. But go to hell, bitch. <laughs> like, it's really crazy. <laughs> That, see, now that's very interesting what you just said, because it suggests that underneath the giant pile of motives that this guy had, there was also a little bit of envy. That there was an envy of you coming from a nice, happy, loving home. And, you know, it, it, th that raises a very important question that has also lingered in my mind as I've taught your case and written about it recently. Why did you feel that you needed this kind of loving paternal figure in your life, even though he was a groomer? Did you have it with your dad? No, Where did so the void my, come from that he took advantage of? There was no void. There, were, there was no void. My father was my exactly. uh, my coach. Um, I, I, I wasn't seeking out his attention. I had just right. got caught up in his seeking my attention. It's interesting. It almost makes me wonder if he competed, like he, he would say things to, to try to knock your dad out of the way. Oh, when my parents separated? Absolutely. If I rode to the store with my dad, I wouldn't tell Jeff, because you know, it would be my dad's weekend to have us. Well, then he would start questioning us, me and my little brother. My little brother didn't know. And so he's like, my little brother would be like, yeah, Jody and Jeff went to the store. And then I knew whenever he'd drive my little brother off, then he's like, oh, so you love your dad more than me? I mean, what what the F were you doing riding with him? I mean, did you sit on his lap? You, and I'm like, no, Jeff, I, I, I didn't sit on my dad's lap. No, I, I, yeah, so he was competing. Like, he's the one that made me not want to be around my father at that time. And, and, and it wasn't that I didn't want to be around my father. It's because if I knew if I hung out with my father, it would get back to Jeff, and then he would throw a guilt trip on me. Or, I mean, he might even, he might even be like, what the hell were you doing with your dad? You know, just pop me upside the head. Um, you, you know, so there was that. It's interesting because the the ancient Greek word that gives that gives rise to the word diabolical, dialobine, means to tear asunder, and it is very characteristic of of evil that it rips relationships apart like that. That part of how it operates is to get in there and say that person's your enemy. Only trust me. Come into my little world. You know. And, and I think that's what gives this story such a horrifying flavor is that truly diabolical quality of coming in, posing like a friend and a mentor while really knocking a loving person out of the way because that person, you know, actually cared about you and therefore had to be eliminated. And then actually, even from the grave, putting you in the, the long term process of being confused about if what your father did was a loving thing or a horrifying thing or a bad thing or a good, because it, it's a it's a fragmentation. And I think that's what's so terrible about it is preying on the kind of innocence of a kid where they're just kind of confused about the questions of morality and the compass is still being built about he, those things. And uh, so, Anne, please jump in there. Yeah. I was just gonna say he also preyed on the, on the parents. Give me a timeline, yeah. Jody. When, when did the parents start having difficulty in their marriage and separate? How old were you? And had they... right. five. So five? I was, no, no, no. I was, so we met Jeff when I was 10. So I would say probably end of 82, end of 1982, and then my parents did not split up until like late July, early August of 83. And then the shooting took place in 84, March of 84. So, I mean, you're looking at the span of a little over a year's amount of time. Yeah. Um, my mother and father, she didn't like his drinking. Okay. So my dad, 
I mean, he, his job was a, a salesman. So his job was to go entertain clients and customers and, you know, so buy them lunch and they go and they have beers. They go to another bar and have beers. I mean, that was kind of his job, but he would come home drunk every night. And, you know, I mean, you can handle that maybe a few nights a week, but I mean, but when you're, you know, raising four kids and your husband's just not helping, um, she said, Gary, you got to quit drinking. You got to go. And he wouldn't quit drinking. And so he had to go. And there's a funny story. And this was in the show. It was called Unraveled on Investigation Discovery. So they, they were separated. My dad's wanting to you know, get back together. And my mother's like, you got to quit drinking. And my dad's like, I haven't had a drink in two months. Come on, June, you got to take me back. And so my mother was considering, considering taking him back. Well, LSU had their first game of the year in football, kicking off the season. And the local news station did a – Channel 2 probably. Uh, they did a story about LSU fans. And they went, and who's leading this year banging a beer? LSU. Wait, hold on. Let me do this. LSU. LSU was my dad. So my mother saw him on the local news with a beer when he's claiming he hadn't been drinking. So, but that was, that was the, the rough spot in the relationship. Well, after the shooting, they told my mother that he would not be allowed to drink. Part of his probation was he couldn't drink. So she took him back and they stayed together for another few more years. Well, his probation was five years and it was a couple years after he got off, off probation, he started drinking again. And my poor dad, my mother goes, I think your dad's drinking again. I said, why? She goes, he only snores when he's drunk and he was snoring his ass off last night. And he hadn't snored in seven years. And I'm like, yeah, daddy got busted <laughs> involuntarily. <laughs> but, and, that, and that's when she left him again because of, he was drinking. But they never divorced. And, I mean, she was living here when he had the stroke. They put him in a nursing home. And she, my sister and her visited him the day before he died. I mean, so they still had a good relationship. It just was more of buddies than it was husband and wife. But the, but the important part was Jeff saw this. Jeff knew that there was this problem in the relationship and he comes in at that time. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, you could say it was a positive thing that Jeff, uh, that Gary got rid of Jeff and then the parents got back together again. Right. But you're absolutely 100 percent. Jeff saw that. And, and the, my mom did an interview recently. And I mean, she says, you know, Jeff would be talking bad about my dad being like, Oh, he's an alcoholic. You know, you should, you should leave him. And so, yeah, he was, he was kind of wedging that, that, you he know, really in there as well. Yeah. And how about this comment? Uh, one th from baby doll. Uh, one thing is for sure. They cannot be rehabilitated. They will always reoffend this blanket statement. Is it true? A lot of people believe it. Um, I, I think you have to go to that. ask Gary with the, from the uh, therapeutic community. Do psychologists or psychiatrists think that they can be? These are pedophiles. You're talking about pedophiles. Correct. And what we would also call are the more fixated pedophiles that are totally committed to children. I think it's going to be enormously hard to, to break that unless you put somebody on surveilling them on 24 hours. And, and, I don't think you could ever trust them around children. Here's uh, Marina, a friend of the show. She says, I'm triggered, uh, shaking off. Oh, I need to meditate. Any advice to people who are victims themselves who then hear these stories and do get triggered? Is there any? Well, she, she, she's, she's got the answer. She needs to meditate. So that's why mindfulness is so popular. It's being able to get your mind set on something positive and not on whatever was was troublesome in the past so that certainly she's doing it herself she's self-comforting go they often talk about go to your safe place in your mind so that's one thing that she's going to do for herself right now which seems appropriate uh, gary you have any input or, or jody what do you think does this ever get on your mind it it really doesn't um i would just say you know do it makes you happy i mean um i i when it, when the question was asked i'm thinking oh good this is for ann <laughs> so i you know i don't know <laughs> she's the expert in that well i i have a question for ann and gary because i am um i'm mystified at how seemingly well adjusted uh jody is i mean he seems like he's really got his s together um you know seems like he's 
figured out life seems very well put together. Uh, and are you surprised guy who's been through so much trauma uh, seems to be doing so well? Well, I take him at his word that he's talked about it. He gets it out. He sees that this is helping others and he has a mission and a goal. And as long as he can stay on that path, I think he's in, in uh, it's very good. I, I evidently has not, he has not talked about some of the things, the more secret things that went on uh, that he would have to answer for himself as to whether he thinks that needs to be addressed or whether it is, he can just the way he's going, but he certainly, I agree with you. He certainly seems very well um, stabilized and very on, on the right path. And Gary, same question to you. I think I would be uh, drowning in self-pity. I can't believe I let this happen. I can't believe I did it to myself. Let this guy do this to me. Um, why do you think he is seemingly um, so well put together after such a series of horrific and traumatic events? It's an extremely difficult question, the question of resiliency in some people. Um, it certainly seems that Jody has made a meaning out of what happened to him so that it doesn't just seem like some kind of random, you know, horrific thing that happened and he needs to believe is going to keep happening or something. He he kind of made meaning out of it and, and I think sort of was able to compartmentalize it and then go out and turn it into altruism to try to decrease the horror out in the world. And I think that takes an exceptional person. I also think, based on what I heard today, and Jody, certainly speak for yourself here, but it also sounds like the fact that his father eliminated this darkness and sort of banished it away gave Jody a kind of unusual opportunity to really put this in a in a box and and kind of move on because the the person was gone. And um, is is there any truth to that, Jody? That that it just in this extraordinary story, your father eliminating Jeff helped with the capacity to move on and kind of have a normal life? I, I believe 100%. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I do want to address one thing that Ann mentioned. Um, the secret that that I'm not talking about is not my secret. You, you had asked about whether he had escalated and gotten violent. And, I, and, you know, it was towards my mother. And so that's kind of like her story to share. So And then she, she can't even look at a picture of Jeff. So, I mean, that's kind of her thing. But, uh, yeah, I think that that definitely ma makes a difference. When, the, when we were in Geraldo, me and my dad were in Geraldo the first time, there was a man who had been molested by, like, a camp counselor, okay? And he never told anybody. And his best friend, when he was, like, 10 years old, was a, a, a girl. Well, she had grown up and had gotten married and had a son and gotten a divorce, and then she had gotten engaged. And so she goes to this man and says, hey, I'm, I'm engaged. Remember so and so, the camp counselor who had molested him when he was younger. That's who she was getting married to. Well, he never said nothing to her. She was, he was just like, you know, I wouldn't do it if I were you. But he didn't tell her why. Well, that camp counselor ended up molesting her son. And so, I mean, this dude, you want to talk about the, one of the biggest emotionally just saddest, one of the saddest people I've ever met in my life. I mean, he had that guilt that he didn't even speak up and it allowed that kid to be, not allow that kid, but it, it, it caused that child to be abused. So he had that guilt and that shame. I never had to worry about that with Jeff. I never had to worry about, am I going to run to him into him at the store? Who is he molesting today? Um, so yeah, I think by daddy eliminating Jeff, I think that that helped out a lot. I mean, again, I don't encourage parents to do that to help their children be there for your child, but I do think that that was a major contributor. I'd like to uh, tee it up for some final thoughts. Uh, the man with the cool movie posters behind him, that is Dr. Gary Bricado, presently a visiting scholar at Boston College, where he collaborates with Dr. Ann Burgess and Victor Petraka on forensic research. He studies, among other things, how violent thoughts and actions emerge in psychotic versus non-psychotic persons. And he's the co-author of The New Evil, Understanding the Emergence of Modern Violent Crime. If you want to pick up that book? There are three good books to get here. The New Evil, uh, that is the one by Dr. Gary Ricardo. Uh, Gary, what was it like to uh, interview Jody Plowshe here? 
Oh, it's a it's a pleasure. I uh, I, I really admire uh, Jody for taking you know picking up the pieces of a horrendous um, series of offenses and and going out there and and doing something altruistic with it. I think it's extraordinary. I mean, remember, Jody, if there's one kid who hears you, goes home, tells his parents, and has the parents have law enforcement go in and stop an offender, chances are stopping that offender stops scores of children from being abused. I mean, even one would make all the work worth it. And I have no doubt that you've had an impact on probably thousands of, of people. And, um, you know, that's something that I think, you know, it's it's extraordinary. And so I thank you. And you were able to really flesh out details of this story that I've always been confused about. The, there's a shortage of information on this case out there. I mean, I think your book is going to be, uh, you know, I've got to get through the whole thing and, the, and I'm going to know a lot more. Um, but but I but I think, um, yeah, it's just I really want to thank you. Uh, and I think this conversation has the wider significance of kind of putting out there the idea that not all pedophiles and hebophiles are the same person. Uh, there, are, there are all kinds of subcategories of them, and some of them are this kind of psychopathic grooming type, and there are other kinds of types. And, and I think that, you know, the more people know about all these little, these types of people that are out there, the more armed they can be. Uh, and um, so I think you're really contributing in, an, in a totally unique way to really helping us delineate, you know, what characterizes this kind of person and how does he lure somebody in? And the way that you depicted it with such, you know, kind of vivid detail, I think is just extremely rich for all of us. I mean, I think Ann and I both learned a great deal uh, from you. And I hope we can continue to collaborate in some way because for people like Ann and me, uh, interviewing you is like a treasure trove of information that's a value for prevention of future crime. Uh, wouldn't you say, Anne? I think uh, it would be nice to stay in touch with Jody. Absolutely. Absolutely. I told um, my students, I have 193 students, and I told them I was going to be working on an interview show with uh, Joel and you and Gary. And they were very interested. They are certainly going to look up the Kate, you're, you're on the online, and I said we would talk more about it next week when I come in so that I have really a much better understanding, and, and it's a great to have the connection that we had back in October 2nd, back in what, 2002. So we, let's hope, as I said earlier, I hope we don't go that long before we have cool. contact again, and I, I echo uh, Gary's point that I've learned so much more just in, in the interview, even in the short time and that's of course due to the, our great host who asks wonderful questions joel you really are superb you uh, were a host so thank you so much for asking the questions thank you and uh, carrie here writes thank you jody i think we're all feeling the same way i did not know this but nurse Kristen writes april is child abuse awareness month across the nation raising awareness and get involved by wearing blue on april 1st and planting a pinwheel garden. Pinwheels are the symbol of a happy childhood. Uh, every kid should have pinwheels. And um, nothing worse I can think of than stealing a child's uh, childhood. Uh, a horrific thought um, when that is stripped of a child. Dr. Ann Burgess, she's a legend. What else can I say about her? She's internationally recognized as a pioneer in the assessment and treatment of victims of trauma and abuse. She was named a living legend by the American Academy of Nursing. Uh, the show Mindhunter on Netflix is loosely based around her work and the people she worked with. And uh, she is also the author of A Killer by Design, Murders, Mindhunters, and My Quest to Decipher the Criminal Mind. And your final thoughts here. Well, my final thoughts are, have to do with, it takes me back to the victim experience that uh, Jody has talked about, but I'm in, I learned more also about the dynamics that were going on in the family and feel that there was a struggle. It's almost a domestic struggle between Jeff and Gary and that the, the uh, killing, whatever you want to call it, ended 
and opened up the freed in a way, I guess, really freed Garrett, um, Jody in that whole triad, if you will, of a relationship and got his parents back together for, for a time. So I, I really think those are important dynamics to know. And it does bring us back to talking about domestic uh, violence as well as childhood sexual abuse. So thank you very much, Jody. Uh, fact very right, Jody. You were awesome. Please link his info, uh, Surviving the Survivor. Uh, Jody, do you want to tell us where people can find you? You have a website that people can go to, and I'll make sure to get the link in there. I don't know how good my website is, but it's jodyploche.net. I will say this. It does have the unedited version of the shooting. It's graphic. I warn you, if uh, you don't like blood, don't, don't look at it. But one of the cool things about the unedited version is that one minute and four seconds, the cameraman takes the tape out of the camera and puts in a new tape and starts filming. That way, if the police came to him and said, hey, we want to confiscate that tape as evidence, he was going to give them the tape that didn't have the shooting on it so he could take the other tape in his bag back to the, the news station. And you can see it one minute and four seconds. You can see it, goes, it gets fuzzy real quick, and, and you can see that. Um, also, um, if I was, you know, say, to be invited to – uh, speak to students in Boston College, I, I don't think I would say no. Um, but uh, you could go on Amazon. You can get the book, Why Geary Why. If you look at the cover, it is, uh, it's based off the shirt my dad had on that night. So, uh, you know, he had on a purple and white striped shirt. Um, so that's what the cover is based all, off of. And I, I would like to share one quick story. Um, I was sitting, all right, so I, I, went to, I graduated from LSU, Louisiana State University. That's where Shaquille O'Neal went to school. And uh, so one day, uh, this was uh, October, a couple years ago, I was sitting in uh, Twin Peaks, and all of a sudden, Shaq comes walking in with this guy. Shaq and this dude go in, they walk in, they sit at the table, they have dinner, and I called my sister because she loves Shaq. So I said, hey, your favorite person just walked into Twin Peaks, and she goes, give him a book. I said, all right, good idea. So I went to my trunk, I got a book, I signed it. Well, Shaq's personal assistant's name is Derek Mallett. I went to middle school with Derek. And so if you see Shaq anywhere, Derek is with him. I mean, they fly on private jets together. So I signed it and I mentioned Derek in the book. So I put on page, you know, 107, I mentioned D-Mac. That's what he's known as. And so I send the book over with the waitress to Shaq. She hands it to Shaq. Well, the guy that Shaq is having dinner with starts doing this. I can see he's looking for me. So I, I kind of wave and he's like, come here, come here, come here. Turns out. He was the son of the other cop, the cop in the video that was walking next to Jeff when uh, daddy shot him. So I'm like, what are the odds? I send one of the most famous people on the planet, a, a book about my dad shooting somebody, and he's having dinner with the son of the cop that got the blood splatter on him. Wow. But the, yeah, you can go to Amazon. My website, uh, I'm at Twitter, at jploche or at jodyploche.com. I use at jploche more. Um, uh, I do have an Instagram, but I don't like Instagram. But yeah, you can go Facebook. You can message me on there. Uh, my email address, website. I mean, you could probably find my phone number and text message if you want. And uh, Debbie writes here, Jody, just thank you for your courage and speaking out. You and your dad are heroes, in my opinion. Uh, Jody details all these experiences in his 2019 book, Why Gary Why, which is what the sheriff's deputy said right after his father shot uh his son's uh sexual assaulter uh so the book again why gary why the jody plache story you can find that on amazon quick programming note for us we will be back with a live i believe it's gonna be 1 30 p.m i'll tweet it out tomorrow on the Lori vallow daybell case and we'll have to get uh Ann and gary on to speak about that as well because that's about as crazy as crazy gets uh when it comes to a murder trial, a double murder trial, a triple murder trial, a lot of dead bodies piled up there. So uh, we'd love to get Ann and Gary back on that. Uh, Jody, I just want to give you the very final word here. If um, someone is a victim or a parent is dealing with their child uh, who went through something, any final thoughts uh, from you or words of encouragement? All right, my final thoughts is kind of how I end my book is that just because you go through something, uh, some type of trauma or a negative experience, 
um, with the proper support, you can be okay. I mean, now granted, um, I, I don't have children. I didn't want to. My uncle, he lost a child at two years old. She got hit by a car. Um, so when I'm talking about you can overcome anything, I, you know, the death of the child is kind of different or, or being the child that got killed. But he still went through life and he still lived the rest of his life, even though he lost a child. So with the proper support, you can overcome almost any tragedy. Very, very uh, profound final thoughts. Marina writes, yes, let's have Anna Gary talk about Lori Vallow Daybell. And this is what I love so much here. Final comment from Brianna. Never heard a jo Jody story. So thank you. You learn something new every day. It's a difficult story to uh, learn about, but one that a lot of lessons can be taken from. And that's why you have people like Dr. Ann Burgess and Dr. Gary Bricado breaking it all down. Special shout out to Jody Plouche. I hope you'll all come back on the show for now. This is my Geraldo homage, by the way, Jody. Love you, America. Love you, Louisiana.